Is it working? Well, yeah, keep talking. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, just to mention, there will be a number of sessions on this telecoupling session here in uh, uh, concept here in the, in the GLP meeting. But what we want to look a bit is how can you establish these links between consumption and production impacts in terms of biodiversity. Um, and everybody, like the speakers who will present here, are working in this kind of field. And everybody, and this is a bit how we framed this talk, uh, faces certain challenges when tackling this issue. And uh, in the remaining talk, I want to, we want to talk a bit about these challenges that we identified and current approaches, how to tackle them, or some ideas, how to move forward. So the, here, like basically, on the one hand, you have a consumption of here in land-based products, here food products. You have changes in this kind of consumption patterns. And on the other hand, you have biodiversity in systems, and the biodiversity is changing. It's not always that um, biodiversity is lost. There's also can be changes in different directions. And in the end, we know that this uh, land use change for this consumption of these products is driving um, biodiversity change to a large degree. And some, we want to establish links between the two sides. So a first challenge relates to how do we measure biodiversity and ecosystem services, and how do we measure their changes in a meaningful way? A second challenge is how do we attribute these changes in biodiversity to different um, products and processes in the, in the uh, and the third challenge is how, how then do we link this to global supply chains, trade flows, and attribute kind of responsibilities for this production of these products and for the impacts in term. And um, if you look at the whole system, then how do we assess trade-offs? Uh, there was a lot of talk about trade-offs in the morning and also in the earlier sessions. And how do we communicate findings um, to, a, to a larger public, both scientific and general? So now going through these four points, the first was like, how do we measure biodiversity changes in a meaningful way? So biodiversity is not a clear cut concept, it's multidimensional. If you look here at these efforts to define um, essential biodiversity variables, you see that, oh, um, I'm not going in detail through it, but there's something like genetic diversity, there's kind of pop, uh, diversity at the population level, at the ecosystem level, and um, it's difficult to, to put um, this into one meaningful number. One attempt that is trying to do this is, for example, the Living Planet Index that looks at um, changes in population abundances around the globe and then aggregates it into one index. But it's, it already shows a challenge that, what, what do you read then from this one number? It shows that it's declining globally, but then when you go to the ground, it's not so clear always what that means. When you look now at studies that have linked biodiversity change to consumption, they have mostly looked at kind of aggregate values, like how species richness is changing, how the numbers, uh, how abundance is changing of species um, in an aggregate way, how, how species threats are changing, the number of species threats, and maybe one way forward, and I think there will be also a presentation going in this way just coming up, is like to look at the effect of land use and the production of individual products on, on individual species. And then you will be able to have a more refined assessment on how ecological communities change. And this is one attempt here is this kind of plotting different characteristics or traits of species here. It's just hypothetical in a certain landscape. With no land use, you have um, a certain distribution of body size, of length of generation time. And then you know with land use, you lose a certain number of species in this mix. But if you don't know which species those are individually, if it's just like, you know, this number, you could only say, okay, they are lost at random. And this, this space here is not changing if you could not change maybe. But if you know how the individual species are affected, you could say then, you could maybe see that like larger species and species with a longer generation time are affected disproportionately. But as I say, this is more outlook. It's not something that is done at the moment. The next step is how do you attribute then impacts to products and activities? It, um, it's typically done to looking at current production patterns and um, link them to uh, it's the old version <laughs> to of the presentation to biodiversity impacts, either current or potential future impacts. And 
it's, but what we have to recognize, I think, is that this is much less straightforward than doing this for other environmental impacts, such as impacts linked to fertilizer use and water use, where you can say, okay, we use water to grow this crop and can attribute and this use to that crop. Um, which is much more difficult to establish causal relationships for, for biodiversity change. Um, in the same line, how do we account for uh, past uses and how they influence current patterns, so kind of legacy effects, and how do we account for something like extinction depth, so what we do now will lead to extinctions of species in the future. And here just an example now, not related to biodiversity, but to tropical deforestation and the work with Martin and Florence Pendrill. Um, just an idea what this kind of attribution could look like is then that you have here um, like impacts from deforestation attributed to different countries and products. So in Brazil, most of the deforestation is attributed to beef production in Indonesia to um, palm oil production, for example. But you want to kind of make a link between the overall impacts biodiversity change, deforestation, uh, uh, to individual products and processes to be then able to link that to supply chains. Um, if you want to trace impacts uh, along the global supply chain, which is kind of stylized here, you want to link, uh, you want to end up, you want to attribute it somehow to consumption here. This is again for a food supply chain, but the general biomass supply chain applies. And the like carbon footprinting and methods like that, many were developed for uh, um, impacts that occur all along the supply chain, such as emissions. But if you think about land use, um, here it's really the case that by far the largest amount of land use, not everything, but really the largest part occurs at the beginning of the supply chain. So we need methods that are able to make this link between consumption here and the beginning of the supply chain in one way or another. And um, I'm not going into the detail of different methods. There's a number of methods that exist, um, how to do that. And I think we will hear a bit more about it in different presentations coming up. Um, two distinctions that um, we want to introduce. On the one hand, there are top-down approaches, looking at um, impacts at the global level and then trying to distribute them among um, different processes, activities, products, so to kind of um, allocate them among activities and so to say assign responsibilities. And the other one is a kind of more life cycle bottom up approach that looks at the individual product here in this example, a chair, and then tries to assign impacts to the different stages of the life cycle of such, of such a product, but has a much more clear focus on a product and a specific production system. And the second point is, um, how we look at trade flows. There's on the one hand a kind of aggregated perspective that looks at the system in focus and then um, a trade flows or a, a drivers of underlying pressure like in a, as a general term, like imports in general, looking at what exports maybe. And then there's this network or telecoupling perspective that links really individual systems of production and consumption or of driving, driving pressures and and where the pressures actually occur. And the final challenge uh, refers to assessing trade-offs and communicate the findings. On the one hand, it is refers to um, all individual parts of what we discussed of such an assessment, but of even more when looking at the whole picture, when bringing the pieces together. So we have this biodiversity metrics, which are hard to grasp for non-experts often. We have different concepts of consumption. So do we look at consumption of food, for example? physical consumption of food, or do we look at uh, consumption in economic terms, which uh, makes a difference, but which also has to be communicated. Then, of course, we want to show with such approaches how local improvements relate to displacements of impacts elsewhere, and how, and I think a good way, and there will be a number of presentations on scenarios, um, they can be used as tools to convey findings and also trade-offs between, between different uh, kind of approaches or settings in such systems. And also important is to look at uncertainties and find ways to communicate them because they are obviously large in such ways. And now just this figure to, from a recent paper led by Alexandra, um, where we looked at biodiversity impact um, and consumption, production versus consumption and how that changes. And then here plot this, um, how, how this changes, um, plotted versus um, GDP per capita and then um, in a trajectory over 11 years. 
and which are, I think, interesting questions. But when preparing this graph, we noticed um, it's really not easy to convey uh, first to to find a way to con convey all these different dimensions, and then also to find a way that is really easy for people to grasp, and I also for us to extract the main messages of that. But it's just an example that I think it, if this systems are so complex and the methods to analyze them become more complex, then it will be also more tricky to to find ways to communicate them or to present them. Um, again, here are the main challenges. I'm not going to go through them again, but just what I want to say is now that in this session we have really a nice and diverse set of speakers who, who are going to present today and tomorrow. And I think all of them will, in one way or another, uh, um, refer to this, some of these points that I made. And uh, we really look forward to that. And I think in general, this kind of complex systems can only be studied um, with working together across disciplines and across teams. And that's why we also look very forward, very much forward to this uh, two days. And uh, the last point is actually, we have now um, five more presentations and then also tomorrow we have, uh, I think five or six presentations um, at three in the afternoon after the coffee break. Um, are we in the same room? Do we know that? No, we were probably somewhere else, but. Okay. Okay, in the main building, in some room. But by then you will have all mastered this VOVA app and find us. And then tomorrow we also plan to say a few words about this special issue plans that we contacted you about, the presenters about earlier. Okay, that's it from my side. Okay, so we have now time for one or two questions, but uh, also to, to, we just keep it one or two because in the end of the session we actually allocated a bit of uh, more time to have a general discussion and then we can address the, you can address the presenters directly or we can discuss among ourselves. So I give now the floor for questions, if there's any. If not, that's okay, I think. Yeah, we will have time to we have a more general discussion yeah. later. And then I think we, um, wait. No, like this. So I will hand over to Jonathan Green, who will present their work in, with Trace. And I have to give back the microphone. Hi, is that working? Can you hear me? Anyone? Yeah. Um, we know that boundless consumption uh, of uh, natural resources is having a dev devastating impact on our planet. And we know that our choices and our behavior as consumers can have these far reaching impacts. And we know that those uh, global impacts are mediated through uh, long, complex, and often opaque supply chains. What we don't really know is what to do about it. Um, and I'm not actually going to give you any solutions, but uh, hopefully uh, talking about some of our recent work as part of the TRACE project um, will help to think about some of the key first steps that we can make, and particularly thinking about uh, what the impacts are at quite fine resolutions, uh, where the impacts are, and who is uh, medi mediating those uh, within the supply chain and who's driving those. Um, and the focus all the way is, is to think about practical information at policy relevant uh, scales. So uh, focusing on the Brazilian Cerrado, um, the Cerrado is a savanna region uh, largely within Brazil. It's roughly the size of Alaska plus California um, and uh, vast areas of it have been lost to agriculture. And even in recent years, we're still losing significant amounts to uh, soy uh, in particular. And it's actually really quite beautiful, um, as some of our colleagues will tell you, uh, despite uh, a, an article in The Economist describing it in 2002 as spare farmland. It has astonishing biodiversity, 30% of Brazil's species occur here, um, and it's also important for water, so supplying major river basins and aquifers for Brazil. But much of the campaigning effort um, is focused around the big five of the Sahado, so it's the uh, from the left, it's the giant anteater, the jaguar, the maned wolf, 
the South American tapir and the uh, giant armadillo. So our work uh, has three uh, main components. Uh, the first is the uh, development of a biodiversity metric. And here we use species as the unit of concern. And this builds upon lessons from uh, some of our colleagues in uh, WWF particularly, um, who found that actually putting a, a face to an impact, be it an orangutan or a dolphin or a giant armadillo, um, can really help to garner support for uh, their cause. Um, and then uh, the second component is uh, a physical model of the production and export and import uh, of commodities, in this case, soy. Um, and that's the, that's the trace model, which you'll probably hear a lot more about in the different uh, presentations over the course of the next few days. Um, in particular, Toby Gardner's uh, session uh, on Friday, one of the keynotes. Um, and then thirdly, where, where trace stops, we then pick it up with a multi-regional input output model to then try and follow embedded uh, consumption and indirect consumption all the way uh, to the final consumer. So we build on earlier work um, by using uh, IUCN and uh, bird life polygons of uh, the ranges of species to figure out uh, what species occur in our, in our landscape. And because these are really quite crude, we then clip those by habitat preferences. And in this case, we use altitude and uh, uh, land cover to then reach a, an extent of suitable habitat. And we also calculate the extent of suitable habitat uh, historically, so we use a pre-industrial land cover map. Um, and then the, what that tells us is on that blue curve, it tells you where we are along it. So if we've already lost a lot of habitat for that species, then uh, any future habitat loss is weighted more heavily in terms of its impact on the future persistence uh, of that species. And then finally, for every species, we then overlap uh, remaining habitat with uh, a, a conversion map for soy to figure out uh, the impacts of the production of that commodity in that particular place on the species that occur there. And I don't want to say too much about this, this is just the outputs from that biodiversity metric. But the key points are that we, we produce it at the pixel scale, and we can scale all the way up to whichever is the most relevant for the particular task in hand, so municipality um, or state. Um, and then we also build it from species data. So we can zoom into an individual species, or we can do, zoom into a particular taxonomic group or narrow range en endemic, so whichever we want. And then this is the, uh, this is the trace platform, a screenshot. Um, and what you can see here is on the left, you've got municipalities, um, and then uh, going through traders in the middle to on the right, we've got China in this case. And there are five and a half municipalities in Brazil. So we're talking about a, on average, a five and a half thousand fold improvement in spatial resolution compared to national level accounting. And the key point is that we have these, uh, our traders in the middle who are mediating the supply chain. We then link, so that, this bit in the middle is our physical production and trade model, um, which we've linked to our environmental extension, and we then link it through to this MRIO. So that gives us the full production to consumption uh, picture. And the high spatial resolution of the models is um, it's a major advance for two reasons. So the first is it enhances the credibility uh, and the spatial representation of the environmental impact that we're interested in, particularly something like biodiversity, which varies a lot over quite uh, small distances. And secondly, it transforms our ability to uh, devise and implement responses. So about a third of the impacts of soy uh, on endemic species occur in Goyas. Uh, but in 2011, there were 41 traders operating out of there and exporting soy from there. Um, however, if you, you can see, sorry, all the, all the symbols have uh, got confused, but there's quite clear delineation between the operations of these different com companies. Um, and so what it actually means is that if you zoom into a particular municipality, often your, uh, your, the companies exporting out of there are exporting well over 90% of the, of the soy. And that really helps to then prioritize the interventions. It helps you to identify where uh, maybe two or more companies might be able to join forces uh, for some collective action rather than taking company sp specific actions. 
Um, so, so to some results. Um, so this is uh, biodiversity impact. So you can see that Brazil has the largest uh, impact. This is a final consumption has the largest impact, uh, perhaps predictably, on its, on its own biodiversity within the Sahara Desert. However, uh, over half of the impact is from foreign demand, and of that, a good chunk of it is China. However, the story is uh, perhaps a little bit more interesting, because actually, if you look at soy consumption, uh, again, at the final, final demand, China actually has the, a greater consumption, and therefore, when you look at the consumption per unit of soy consumed, uh, China is actually doing reasonably well. And that's all to do with the, the pattern of sourcing of uh, Brazil versus China, for instance, where Brazil is sourcing from uh, more biodiverse places and more recently converted places. So quantifying the, the impacts on culturally important, charismatic, or valuable species uh, can really help to raise uh, awareness of an environmental issue, and it can really help to uh, sharpen the focus uh, on of risk for companies operating in the area. So to illustrate this, um, I thought I'd put up these two. So the first is the main wolf, uh, bottom left, which is described as a, a fox on stilts. Um, and the second is uh, the giant anteater, which is sometimes described as looking like a toilet brush, which I think is a bit unfair. Um, but it is quite a weird looking animal. Um, but the, the point of this is really just to show that um, the, there, are, there are differences in, in, so on the left we've got states where the impact is occurring, on the right we've got the countries which are driving that change or driving that loss. And the differences you see are to do with differences in the threats that the species is facing, which is to do with their habitat preferences, uh, and also ch differences in the, uh, the sourcing patterns of the, uh, the countries and the companies that supply them. And so you can see for the EU, a lot of the, its impacts on the main wolf are uh, occurring in Mato Grosso, whereas for Brazil, it's generally occurring in other states. And this has implications then for uh, the downstream actors who might want to take some uh, mitigation or intervention um, to, regarding their specific impacts. And then lastly, just thinking about how government and private commitments overlap. And so I want to focus on the Amsterdam Declaration uh, on Deforestation here. So this is where seven EU countries uh, pledge support to eliminate deforestation from supply chains um, in their countries. Um, but what's interesting is think about how that then aligns with private sector commitments. So this is uh, so uh, the seven countries on the right. So they've all pledged their support for this uh, zero deforestation. Uh, and then on the left, you've got the companies that supply soy into those, country, into those countries. And in green, those, those are the companies that have their own zero deforestation commitments. And in orange, uh, they don't. And so you can immediately see that uh, for the UK, for Germany, for France, um, although we can't say the, green, the greens are sustainable yet, um, we can at least say that the, 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 there is good alignment between the objectives and the interests of the state actors, along with the, the private enterprise that is, uh, that is putting a lot of soy into those countries. On the other hand, the Netherlands, where a lot of the soy is coming from actors who don't have this public commitment to zero deforestation, you can immediately identify um, potential uh, consortiums of actors that might, you might want to sort of uh, try and have some leverage upon. And then uh, lastly, it's just a, it's a cloud of faces involved in the, in the, in the papers uh, behind this work. So uh, just a thanks to them and also to uh, Alexandra and Thomas for inviting me. So, thank you. Okay, so again, time for questions, one or two questions. Yeah, please. Yeah, sorry, not this slide, right? Um, yeah, so the, so the Netherlands, for instance, is a major hub for soy coming in, yeah. right? So this is the first, the, the country of first import for this one. So uh, this is the only the only slide where that's the case. So this is just looking at imports of soy. Um, 
Sorry? No. Wait, what we're saying here is that there is a, there's a potential key leverage point as a logistics hub uh, for the Netherlands. And in fact, the Netherlands is one of the key actors in the Amsterdam Declaration. Um, and that there is, I do have another slide here. Um, so, so on this graph here, sorry, you can't really see it, but this is the Netherlands. So on the, on the left, you have direct imports. And on the right, you have final consumption. So for all of these other Amsterdam Declaration com countries, you can see that the direct imports uh, uh, underestimate their final consumption. But for the Netherlands, it's the opposite way around. It is IOTA. Yes, <laughs> so it doesn't. Yeah, so, so it's IOTA. Uh, I work with uh, Chris West and Simon Croft uh, in uh, SEI York. Okay, yeah, yeah good question. <laughs> okay. No more questions for now. So I, I think this is it. I, I will try to repeat your questions so that it's recorded. So that's why I was a bit here coming. Uh, with the mic, but it's a bit difficult. I'll just repeat the questions. But Sorry, I just with the technical problems, I want to have make one announcement that I forgot before. The talk of Sandrine Nonhebel, who will talk about livestock systems in Mexico, it had to be moved to tomorrow. It is in the program today, but it will be moved to tomorrow because she uh, missed the train connection. And um, now I will hand over to Abhishek Chaudhary um, with his presentation on phylogenetic diversity. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as uh, Thomas said in the introduction, uh, most studies till now, they are quantifying the impact of human activities on biodiversity using the species loss as an indicator, uh, which is more of an egalitarian approach, uh, assuming that each species has uh, equal value. Uh, in this talk, we have developed a uh, new metric, uh, which is evolutionary history loss. Um, and I have connected that to uh, socio-economic uh, databases from FAO to calculate uh, the impact of each crop in each country on the evolutionary history uh, of mammals, birds, and amphibians. So uh, I, was a, I did PhD and postdoc in ETS Zurich, and just four months ago, I moved to India uh, to, uh, to accept this assistant professor position. So starting. Uh, with the, uh, so we know how bad the situation is uh, regarding uh, how humans are damaging the environment. Uh, but the food sector is one of the uh, very exceptional uh, sector because if we can manage our food systems uh, 
sustainably, not only can we manage the malnutrition um, and the human health problems, but also the environmental uh, degradation. So the food, managing global food system provides uh, really uh, great opportunities uh, for future uh, and create win-win situations. Um, and the fundamental point in that is we have to know for each product what we eat, uh, what is its nutrition value, which we can already find for uh, most part. But uh, the future is if we can also find the environmental information on each product, uh, what is the damage done to the biodiversity, uh, you know, a bottle of milk, let's say. So that's the motivation of this research. Uh, and there has been success stories. Once we know uh, which food item is creating damage, we can mitigate through uh, various uh, uh, strategies, let's say a Brazil soya moratorium that has resulted in reduced deforestation and all. If we just Google most sustainable countries in the world, uh, we get uh, this very simplified indicators. Let's say this is the environmental uh, performance index developed by Yale. And we always get Switzerland, Sweden, Norway, you know, these countries at the top. But the catch here is that uh, this index only takes into account the uh, damage to biodiversity domestically. So if you, your country has a uh, huge protected forest, you automatically go up. But it does not take into account the damage done by consumption of a country outside uh, their country. So this can be misleading and lead to complacency. So we need uh, an indicator which, uh, which takes into account both domestic as well as the imported impact. So the carbon, land, and water footprinting, that, uh, that field has more advanced. So we already have a very good idea uh, what is the land footprint or carbon footprint of different food items uh, because the methodology is much more simpler. But biodiversity is much more complex because uh, it is distributed non-randomly uh, around the globe. And uh, it really depends from where the product is coming. So a pre preliminary analysis results we reported last year. Um, so these are the biodiversity footprint of each country's food consumption, food consumption related biodiversity footprint in terms of uh, species loss. So in per capita terms, we see that uh, these countries, they have the higher impact. Uh, and uh, India has a huge impact, but because it's huge population, so uh, per capita impacts are much lower. These are the nutrition prof profiles. So these countries in the red, they, uh, they have malnutrition problems, so low intake of essential nutrients. The second graph tells the countries which have a high intake of bad nutrients, like cholesterol, fat, and all. So this, this, uh, the whole point here is that uh, sustainable development goals uh, they also uh, encourage us to look at a system perspective. So not only just one indicator, but uh, different indicators of sustainability. So here, uh, this was the result on biodiversity, but we now would like to uh, just give you an idea how that was calculated. Uh, so we use uh, countryside species area relationship model, uh, which uh, basically uh, if you know what is the human land use in a region, you can calculate how many species are going to go extinct. So uh, let's say we have 100 species in a region uh, in Cerrado, and then we know how much is, uh, what percent is agriculture, what percent is pasture, and how much is natural forest. In this region, we can calculate out of these 100, let's say 80 will go extinct in near future. We can also tell out of these 80 how much uh, is because of uh, pasture or agriculture. So that's the power of this simple model, uh, countryside uh, species relationship. So once we know how much species will go extinct because of agriculture, and if we know uh, from global maps uh, what crops uh, are in that region, so we have these, uh, you, sh you should be knowing from uh, Dr. Ram Raman Kuti and all, uh, they have uh, global pixel level maps of crop yield and area. So we can connect that and we can tell then, okay, uh, what is the biodiversity impact of wheat or soya production in Cerrado per kg? 
And if you know how much KZ Netherlands is importing, we can simply tell uh, what are the species impact uh, due to soya consumption in Netherlands. So this is again uh, the illustration how the model works. So it takes into account how many species are there in the region, what are their habitat preferences. So let's say if a region only has house sparrow, it can also survive with humans, no problem. So the impact uh, will be less, but if the area has very sensitive species who can only survive in natural uh, vegetation, and then you have human uh, land use there, so uh, we will get a higher species load. So this model takes into account these things. Uh, so with Dr. Kastner, we already have some first results, uh, which countries consum food consumption or trade uh, causes how much species loss. Uh, we can say that uh, the rubber, cocoa, and coffee imports from Indonesia to US, that's the highest um, species loss, around 14 species are threatened with extinction due to US consumption of Indonesian food products. So, so it's a, because we have limited uh, increasing population and limited uh, land, uh, the narrative nowadays is basically the Noah's Ark dilemma, who should we save? Uh, because timing is running out. So there, some people have argued that, uh, working on genetic diversity, that uh, in a region, uh, we should look for maximizing the evolutionary history within a region. So the analogy is basically, if in a room you have 10 people with different skills, this team will be more resilient to a team where you have all 10 people you know, from one discipline. So people, uh, so a region with more diverse, evolutionary distinct species uh, can cope up better with the climate or global change and uh, have higher probability of uh, preserving the tree of life or life on earth in general. So that's the main argument behind using evolutionary distinctiveness, evolutionary loss as an indicator compared to species loss. And there are some experimental studies they have shown that uh, if you have a field farm and you grow uh, s crop species which are evolutionarily distinct, uh, it is less likely to fail as a change of climate change. Or so, so, so how do we do? We have three steps to convert species loss to PD loss, uh, which is phylogenetic diversity and evolutionary histories, uh, interchangeable words. So we, uh, through some uh, collaborators in uh, Simon Fraser University in Canada, they carried out some pruning simulation uh, and we found that, uh, and by the way, each species, mammal, bird, and amphibian has an evolutionary distinctive score. Let's say uh, gorilla has 80 million years of evolutionary history and then compared to uh, some other mammal which has only 40. So we have for each species this score and uh, we just sum them up. So this first we calculate the species loss we let's say out of 180 will go extinct. And then we sum up the ED score randomly for these 80 species. And then we can calculate uh, the phylogenetic, the evolutionary loss in the region using this simple re linear relationship. So the more details are in this paper. So this is what we found. This is where uh, the global hotspot where the highest evolutionary history will go extinct in near future if nothing is done now. So the usual suspects, uh, Southeast Asia, Congo Basin, and uh, yeah, the Northeast Latin America. And these are how we divided the total loss into different land use types. So in Indonesia, uh, agriculture and the forestry is the main culprit. Um, uh, so the palm oil is included as forestry. So this is, we can tell which country, which drive, which is the main driver. Then we linked uh, this to uh, FAO stat and we came up with uh, such maps. Uh, so we can say that which country's food consumption is causing, is likely to uh, threaten the evolutionary history. So we can see with most population. Uh, and these are the important, so the India is net exporter, but US is next, uh, net importer of uh, evolutionary history loss. And uh, important result is that uh, if you remember in the species loss, uh, 
US imports from Indonesia were the most uh, significant uh, bilateral uh, trade element causing the most loss. But here, using evolutionary history loss, th this change is now the imports from Ecuador to US now becomes the highest, uh, most damaging trade flow. Because somehow uh, the in, Equ in Ecuador, the, evolu the evolutionary distinctiveness of species, the score is higher. So because of natural barriers, these species have evolved uh, for a longer time than those in Indonesia. So then we also extended this uh, approach uh, in another paper where uh, we have future 2050 scenarios from land use harmonization uh, database and we can tell which region in 2050 will lose the most uh, evolutionary history. So uh, that's just an overview. Uh, thanks a lot. Any questions? Try to read here. Yeah, I mean, let's. I mean, if you look, let's say the tea from Sri Lanka. You know, we, we know about soya from Brazil or palm oil from Indonesia or Malaysia, but tea from Sri Lanka, uh, you know, we have this whole list of around 8,000 flows, but if you see in this table, tea and rubber, they are not really the usual suspects, but using this indicator, uh, they come up much higher, so. And also, um, this is already, detailed or very detailed at the product level. I wonder if you have uh, plans or if you think it would be interesting to couple this actually to a life cycle framework so that you could actually uh, maybe then use this type of information for the certification uh, Yeah, I mean, so this is uh, actually one step ahead. So behind this, we already have these factors, uh, projected loss of evolutionary history per kg of tea from Sri Lanka. So that I did not show, but that's already calculated and it's there, ready to use in LCA type of case. Yeah. Uh, Okay, the next flash talk is actually given by Rüdiger Schaldach, um, who is standing in for Jan Göpel, who cannot be here today. And they will, uh, he will present their work on um, modeling a German bioeconomy in 2050. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> one is enough. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, uh, as already said. Uh, I'm here on behalf of my colleague Jan Göppel, who unfortunately couldn't make it. And uh, what I'd tr uh, present, I, I've tried to do my very best to present uh, here some, let's say, conceptual work that we are doing in a larger research project, the BIPASA project, and this project aims to uh, identify uh, transition pathways for uh, uh, towards a sustainable uh, and uh, socially accepted bioeconomy uh, bio in Germany. And uh, our part in this project is basically the, the development and evaluation uh, of different scenarios. And uh, for this purpose, uh, we set up or we do this with a three-step approach. In the first step, um, we have set up a scenario panel of experts that constructs uh, qualitative uh, storylines of the future um, bioeconomy in Germany in 2050 and potential pathways towards uh, this, uh, these endpoints. Then, based, based on these narratives, 
we do a translation of specific uh, specific uh, contents of, of these narratives uh, to uh, quantitative data that we then can use to drive simulation models. So for example, here we specify which amount of biomass is used by the German um, uh, uh, chemistry sector in the year 2030-40-50. In addition uh, to these national scenarios, um, we, hello, um, we do a, uh, establish a connection uh, to a global context. For this purpose, uh, we map our scenarios uh, to uh, different shared socioeconomic pathways. And again, also from these two sources, we then take this quantitative model driver and use them. Here we now enter step two of our scenario development procedure uh, into a set of uh, different uh, coupled models. Um, two of these models are economic models. So on one hand, we have here the general equilibrium model magnet which basically covers the whole econom uh, economy. And then for the forestry sector, we use a more specific model, that's the GFPM model. The output of these models are then used for further analysis. It's not a, uh, a linear uh, solution here. We are also doing some, some feedback, have implemented some feedback mechanisms here uh, in order uh, to uh, generate uh, consistent uh, data between these models. But these global models here are then coupled uh, to another more or less economic model that <coughs> is related uh, to the uh, German en energy sector. And <coughs> what we are, where we are more uh, involved here in at University in Kassel is the Landshift model. And with Landshift, uh, we can uh, simulate the impacts of these bioeconomic developments on, the on land use changes and environmental impacts uh, on the global scale. So this means the output of land shift are global maps of land use change. So here's the global map and here you see uh, a small, uh, smaller map uh, for the development here uh, in, in, in Europe uh, between uh, two time steps. Spatial resolution is uh, five arc minutes. That's about nine to nine kilometers at the equator. So and now based on all this information, on this spatial information, we can do all this nice little uh, analytics that we have seen in the previous talks. And we bring these elements, this information, together with information that is generated with the other or by the other models. And so this allows us uh, to generate information about crop yield changes, for example, biomass trade quantities, loss of natural vegetation bio and uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services, but also on typical land use uh, change um, elements. And of course, because also, also this model is based uh, basically on kind of MRIO, it's based on a, on a GTAP database, is this allows us uh, also to do uh, all these, um, um, all these uh, footprint analysis that we've already heard about. And now we come to the third step. Uh, the third step is fed by all this information. And here we set up another stakeholder panel that or a group of stakeholders that analyzes uh, these scenario outcomes with regard to socially, uh, to social acceptance of the German population. So this means we not only look at numbers, how much biodiversity is lost, how much land use is changed, uh, but we also uh, try to reflect there or find out um, which pathways are socially accepted and su would be supported uh, basically by, uh, by, by, um, by, the uh, by uh, German people. And this whole thing here uh, is uh, done in an iterative way. So this means we do uh, typically, uh, or we, uh, we aim to do uh, three uh, of these iterations here between the different elements. And now we are in the second iteration and uh, come up with uh, the first model uh, results. And um, the end points, the final result um, of what we do here are then consistent qualitative and quantitative scenarios of the German bioeconomy plus, this already mentioned, information on socially acceptance of these scenarios. All right, I thank you very much for your attention. That was a flash talk, by the way. So, <laughs> hope I'm still in time. <laughs> thank you very much. A very brave flash talk and very nice. Uh, any questions? 
Um, at this moment, yes, please, Thor. Yes, so uh, basically the stakeholders are uh, confronted with, with all sorts of information. Uh, so, uh, and another important thing is uh, that the stakeholder groups are different. So here we really have a panel of experts that develop these uh, storylines. And these are confronted, uh, of course, uh, also uh, with, with these modeling results. But here the, uh, um, the, the purpose is, is a bit different with the second things that I, I, will, I will explain later. Here it's more about consistency. So this means to, to evaluate if uh, the storylines are kind of, uh, kind of consistent with, with, with which what the models say, basically. And then uh, here we have uh, this uh, second stakeholder dialogue. And it's, it's, it's much broader. Here we have larger workshops really with a broad range of stakeholders. And uh, also our colleagues, uh, our colleagues are also doing uh, different, ki different kinds of surveys. And also here they get basically all the information. They got the storylines and in a bit more condensed way, we also confront them with uh, scenario results. Then let them decide what is acceptable, what is not, or which parts are acceptable, uh, acceptable, which parts are not acceptable. And then the results also from these stakeholder uh, workshops here are presented in the next round of iteration uh, to the scenario panel to further adju adjust the scenarios. And it's, it's not as a task for us to come up with a golden egg to, to find really a pathway. It, it, it is more to, to, uh, to find out more uh, about um, let's say, uh, let's say uh, put, uh, potential stepping stones uh, which, which might be there in order to establish a bioeconomy economy or to find out if bioeconomy is a useful pathway. I, d I don't know, I have no idea about it. And we are it's still an open question for me. Silence. <laughs> In the ideal world, we would. Uh, in the non-ideal world, we are about four months behind our schedule, and <laughs> we will have to find ways to to communicate uh, things. So this means so normally, when when everything would work fine, really we would we would have done all these uh, analytics of environmental impacts after the first round with a fully functional coupled suite of models, and then prepare them, of course, for the stakeholders and, and, and show them also the different environmental impacts there. But reality was a bit different, as I said, and uh, here we, we have to linger around a bit uh, with showing preliminary model results and with giving them additional information that were available from other studies, what this might mean, for example, for carbon sequestration, for loss of carbon storage, and also for biodiversity impacts. Next time will be better, I hope. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Now we have to move on to Philip's presentation from University of Vienna. So hello everybody, I'm Philip and um, I'm going to present a, a project that has just started about a year ago and uh, for me it still feels like it just began. So I think this is the first time that this is presented and I'm more or less just going to present the general uh, workflow or idea of, uh, of this project. 
Um, so you can see there's um, quite some people involved. Thomas is one of them. And uh, most people working on it are sitting in Vienna, in Austria. And it's also funded by a Viennese funding agency, which is why uh, we focus on, on Vienna, among other things. So this project is going to estimate the biodiversity footprint of a large city, and in this case of Vienna, but when it works, maybe it's possible to, to repeat this or to run this for other uh, cities. Okay, so the idea is to, um, oh and another thing is that there's uh, several work packages and different people involved in each work package, of course, and uh, I'm more or less representing many parts which other people will do and pass on in this workflow. So, okay, Austria, this is an outline of the country of Austria. And we start with the domestic uh, material consumption, estimated with a material flow analysis framework through trade and statistic uh, national stati statistic databases, um, which more or less estimate what is the um, domestic production or domestic extraction, they call it, um, together with imports from somewhere else minus the exports to find out what is uh, consumed within Austria. Now, we want to know what the city of Vienna is consuming in this case. And um, these databases are mainly, uh, or are, are uh, only available on a national scale. So we will know what happens in, o in Austria. And we will need to um, apply or develop conversion factors um, based on expenditure data or population size of the city of Vienna. Um, so from, from this exercise, we will then know how much of uh, quite many commodities is consumed in Vienna. Um, yes, yeah, so how much of these final products are, go are going into Vienna from different sources. Then through uh, another set of conversion factors, we will try to estimate how much of primary products were needed to produce these commodities through caloric equivalents or uh, carbon content and so on. So this is a method uh, developed by Thomas. Um, in another step with uh, coming from import-export tables, um, we will find out where these uh, primary products were produced and through uh, yield data uh, how much area has been used for these uh, to, or to produce these primary products. So we will know where, how many, uh, how much area will be used by the city of Vienna in the end. Uh, we will then feed this into a um, species richness uh, model. So, so far it looks like wha what, what Abhishek uh, um, presented earlier. Uh, like we're going to use the countryside species area relationship model. And um, we are thinking of um, parameterizing it with, with the predicts database. That's the, that's the step where we are at now. And we'll have a meeting in about an internal meeting in about two weeks where we will talk further about which kind of model, how we par parameterize it and so on. And then, um, as we heard in the previous presentation, we will try to run some kind of life cycle analysis uh, approach to feed back this, the results from the species richness model into the consumption of Vienna. Um, and this can go both ways, either um, like, for example, by trying to optimize the, the species richness um, impact from the model side, or by looking at uh, how can we change um, like consumer behavior or, um, or to change the, like, for example, to look at um, 
nutritional uh, recommendations or something like that and see how that would change the, the species richness um, impacts. And there's also a stakeholder process built in in this loop to um, to create some kind of realistic option space of, of, of how these these things can be um, can be done. So now in this um, in this mess of different uh, of different approaches, uh, we uh, e each of these approaches has gone a bit further uh, by now, but. Um, but we don't have, we can't show any results yet because because everything is so interdependent that only towards the end I think we can we can show something. And um, now each of these processes or each of these parts or work packages has um, has their has its own set of problems for which we have either found solutions or uh, thought about uh, certain solutions. And I'm now going to um, show one specific problem. I just picked one, um, and that would be the regionalization of this predicts database. Um, so this predicts database is a, a more or less a collection of plot-based um, species uh, um, survey data with uh, including only uh, including only studies which which have looked at land land use um, at different land use categories so that it's possible to compare it with uh, the with some kind of a baseline value now um, here we can see where these different plots are which are in the ba database so far or at least in the last version that I have and we also uh, and if we zoom into Europe we see that there is no plot in Austria. Um, and uh, since we know, or we already uh, estimated that a, a large proportion of the Viennese consumption is produced within Austria, uh, it would be quite, Im quite an issue, or it's quite important for us to, to have good data for Austria. Um, so, there is now, uh, we have access to a cultural landscape monitoring scheme from the um, Austrian Environmental Agency who are looking at species um, survey or who are making species surveys in different cultural landscapes in different um, um, uh, land use categories. Um, but we know as uh, what's important is to be able to compare this with some kind of a baseline. As has been done uh, here using the PREDICTS database um, where they use the primary, primary vegetation plots to compare with. Um, to do this, there are uh, several survey plots uh, or several databases for different taxonomic, taxonomic groups to, um, uh, which also exist uh, across um, Austria and we are then wishing or trying to compare this with a potential, a potential natural vegetation map so that we can link these two um, and that we, that we can link the natural landscape survey plots with the um, land use category plots um, and thereby define some kind of a um, baseline, baseline species richness. Um, how much time do I have left? Two minutes? Um, what else can I say in these two <laughs> minutes? <laughs> yeah, maybe I can, maybe I can just, um, maybe if somebody has comments on this um, and relieve the schedule also a little bit, um, I'd be quite happy to hear anything. Yes, please. It's on, I think it's two two steps below, um, two steps below national level. So it's um, this. What is it called in English? District. 
it's district level. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit, uh, it's a bit finer than than national level. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, now, I, I <laughs> that's a mean question, I, but I think it's um, um, the what has been uh, what or what what the people doing on the, the side of the con consumption have found is that the per capita consumption in cities uh, is different than the per capita consumption uh, on in the countryside. For example, they, um, they found that there's less, uh, less meat consumption in the cities, for example, than in the countryside. Just, uh, just to name, just to have one example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Something else? Yes, please. Ah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, <coughs> I was quite surprised uh, when this uh, project started that um, the people who are on the consumption side, so the ones who are who are working on that, um, they told me that this doesn't exist, and also that um, that it's not clear if, for example, all uh, all cities across Europe or something like that have a similar consumption pattern. And um, so, of course, if we want to, if, if that was, if that was your, your question, if you want to kind of um, apply this approach to, to different cities, we would have to find out if, uh, let's say, like people living in cities or at least in Central European cities have a similar uh, consumption pattern um, across the, the, the study region. And... Uh, how we're going to do this is something that I can't really explain now because uh, because I'm working on the other end on the on the species richness end. Um, but uh, apparently, uh, they uh, have uh, they have ideas. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Time's up. I heard. Yeah, but we can we can talk. You can ask later. I mean yeah. Really okay. <laughs> Okay, so now we, we, we are going to change a bit from biodiversity to ecosystem services, but you will see that um, the challenges are, some are very similar to what Thomas described for biodiversity. Um, here is an overview of the presentation. I'll start by explaining uh, the approach we took on this work. Then I'll pass into explaining a bit of how the water purification accounts were calculated or built. Um, just mention multi-regional input output analysis and then present you some of the results that we got. Um, 
starting by the CEA, and the, the acronym stands for System of Integrated Environmental and Economic Accounts, Experimental Ecosystem Accounts. This is important because it's actually the, the framework for which that, that the, pro the project is, is built upon. The main difference from these experimental ecosystem accounts to the, to the CEA central framework is that the central framework takes a perspective of the environmental asset alone, so say water or timber, and sees how this asset moves in the economy. Um, whereas the e experimental ecosystem accounts looks at the ecosystem and how these environmental assets interact within natural processes. Um, ay, 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 ay. <laughs> ay, 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 again. <laughs> okay. Um, so this work, it's, it's, um, it's making use of the, the consumption-based indicator for water purification is making use of a, of a bigger project at JRC that is called INCA, and it stands for Integrated System for Natural Capital Accounting. And this, this project, the objective is to build a set of uh, ecosystem services accounts at JRC uh, until 2020, and addressing uh, several policy needs. Of course, we are uh, an European institution, particularly it's, it addresses policy needs regarding the EU biodiversity strategy, but also, <coughs> for example, international policy needs as the Sustainable Development Goals. This work, um, the Inca project builds upon the very well-known mapping uh, and assessing ecosystem services initiative, uh, but also supports this work. These are a couple of, so there's, uh, now there's a couple of ecosystem services accounts already built, um, pollination, for example, water purification, outdoor recreation, but the project is still ongoing, and there will be a couple of more by 2020. The the approach that my colleagues take at GRC to build the ecosystem services accounts is always starting with a biophysical model and use this to uh, map the potential um, ecosystem service, the potential supply of the ecosystem service and also um, the demands. And then by, by overlaying these two, it's determined the actual flow, so the actual use of the ecosystem service, how much the economic agents are using this ecosystem service. Then there can be a, um, a translation into monetary terms, and then finally the ecosystem service supply news tables are built, uh, compiled at the national level, and they can be done in monetary or physical terms. Here we will, I will, um, I used the physical um, supply news tables. Um, to explain a bit of how, how the water purification accounts were built and which model was used, which biophysical model was used, we used, well, they used, it was not me, but my colleagues used the green model, which is a statistical, um, spatially explicit um, catchment model. Uh, and this model uses nitrogen and phosphorus input to then, um, it models its, its flow across the water streams and then derives some water quality measurements. Um, there's two nitrogen and phosphorus inputs. Um, this model considers two uh, main sources of these two nutrients. The diffuse sources, which are related with uh, agricultural um, activities, mostly mineral, mineral fertilizers and manure. It also takes into account atmospheric deposition in some scattered dwellings, but mostly the diffuse sources are related with agricultural activity. And then point sources, which are more um, are smaller, much smaller, and are more related with the uh, industries or larger urban areas. Um, here it's important for me and for this project to tell you that it was, so the green model actually takes into account the upstream flow. So it is a, it's, it's, its level of resolution is the catchment, so it, it takes into account if a nutrient that is not retained in this catchment and continues downstream, the model takes that into account. However, to build the water purification accounts, we could not um, take this quantity of nutrients uh, into consideration. And this is mainly a, an allocation problem. But s because since, since, since the nutrient is running downstream, then we don't know where is it coming from or who is actually disposing this nutrient. So here, what I will show you is just the diffuse sources, but just the local the local one, so there's a lot of nutrient that is missing. We, we only used nitrogen, so also phosphorus is missing, another, another limitation. Um, 
so what we calculate, what it was calculated with the water purification accounts, and this is maybe a bit not so intuitive. So what we are considering is the amount of nutrients. So there's agricultural agriculture that uh, uses um, nitrogen. Part of this nitrogen is used by the crops. Part of it is retained in the soil, and then part of it is um, is um, is going to the water streams. And what we what we consider water purification is the ability of this stream to clean part of this nitrogen that's coming in. So this is the numbers we are talking about. It's not all of all of it, but it's this component of, of the nitrogen that is removed by plants or microorganisms activities, some nitrification and sedimentation as well. But this is what we are talking about here. So it's uh, pollution not done because the ecosystem service was able to clean it. Um, here is okay, I can pass this. Here I think it's also I mean why a consumption based indicator for water purification. I think here the most important concept to 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 share with you is that the notion of embedded ecosystem services. So we we do have agricultural products that are traded and they have impacts on biodiversity in the production uh, places, but they also carry with them some services that were used, that nature this uh, made available by fr for free and here we not introduce, it's not us that introduce this notion, but we talk about embedded ecosystem services in uh, agricultural uh, trade, uh, traded products. Um, sorry. Um, so we use this water purification accounts. We link this to a multi-regional input output model already uh, presented here. And then we um, built this consumption based water purification indicator and we could also quantify the interregional flows of water purification. Most of you probably know this, but this is the may maybe the, the, the look of a multi-regional uh, input-output table, and this is the backbone of an input-output model. And the most important part here is that um, we have the, all the relationships between all the countries and sectors in the world, because it's a multi-regional model. And as you can see, we have international trade uh, relationships described and this is obviously essential if we want to talk about um, this um, these teleconnections and then and also this interregional flows um, here are some of the results and they are already what you are what you are used to see we have um, above uh, this is is Nick it's uh, this is not correct here it's production based and here is consumption based I'm sorry for that but we will see that in, in Italy and um, Italy, France are the biggest, um, are the countries where that use most of the water purification service, but they also use that uh, to, ex well, part of it goes via export relations and embodied in agricultural products. Um, these are the typical results for this type of analysis. We can also determine the net importers and exporters of water purification um, and we can also, as I told you, see who is importing what from whom. Um, and here I can also tell you that around 30% of the water purification service is, um, is traded internationally. And here we have the main trading relationships. You see Germany as a, uh, the biggest net exporter, receiving a lot of water purification service from Italy, for example, from France and other countries. Here I have to tell you that, uh, and I forgot this before, uh, that um, we the water purification accounts were built for Europe, so we can only track the relationships between European countries and what European countries export. However, we cannot here account for what comes from other countries of the world. So this is basically intra-European trade um, and also exports from Europe, but not imports from other countries. Um, this is a map of... Uh, of a, a matching of the, of the potential ecosystem service and the demand, and this gives you a notion of the overuse of the service. And you see that Italy, for example, is one of the countries that has very pressured already water bodies. But <coughs> as, as, um, as you see here, it's also a country that exports, not, not the highest exporter, but it exports a lot of um, water purification service. And here I just wanted to, um, to show that perhaps this type of approach gives a new um, 
information or new ways to see information that can be important at the policy level and to, to um, maybe um, use this information in a new way in policy. Um, important here, and this was also a, a, a case study for that, is to actually to see how these ecosystem services accounts can be used to develop new information that was not previously available before the accounts were built. So it's also a test case to a showcase of the ecosystem services account. And I think this is it. Thank you so much. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs>